William Conway comes to us with about as much experience as anyone could ever accumulate. He started as a volunteer in the zoo world in 1945 and then uh, rose all the way to, to come to serve as the, as the president and CEO of the Bronx Zoo in New York City. He's a past president of AZA and a current or past director of many conservation organizations, including the National Audubon Society, the World Wildlife Fund, Sea Turtle Conservancy, International Crane Foundation, um, and the Global Conservation Network of the ICUN. He was founder of the Society for Conservation Biology, a past regional counselor of the ICUN, and has received numerous honors. He's written 260 popular and technical articles, books, and reports on wildlife conservation, demography, genomics, colonial species, natural history, zoological gardens. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm in awe. In 2005, Island Press published a, his book on wildlife conservation in the Southern Cone, Act Three in Patagonia, People and Wildlife. Dr. Conway. Thank you very much, Mike. You know, that's the first time I've heard the use of the word segue since Marlon Perkins died. <laughs> In the 1860s, when my mother's father was born, millions of American bison still grazed the Great Plains and billions of passenger pigeons flew through our forest. Carolina parakeets nested there while millions of Eskimo curlews were being slaughtered on U.S. shores. In 2009, field scientist George Schaller, just back from Africa, expressed relief at finding the mountain gorillas of Rwanda's famous Virunga Volcanoes National Park, which he had studied many years before, well protected. This is the main remaining population of the giant primate. In 2010, the National Geographic reported villagers living around the Barangas murdered park rangers and gave government officials three months to respond to a petition to reduce the park by 90%, after which the villagers would move in, grow crops, and defend their activities with gunpoint. We have generated a world of well wildlife remnants. Our seven billion people influence more than 83% of the earth and wild species populations have diminished by 30% since 1970. Almost 47,000 species are at risk of extinction. Humanity is now encroaching on protected areas from Africa's Albertine Rift to the Amazon in Brazil. The rate of forest loss in Madagascar, if continued, will destroy all its primary forests by the year 2067, and with it all forest-dwelling animals. Ecuador is seeking to blackmail other nations into paying if, not, if it is not to destroy its Yasuni National Park for oil and timber. Even the most conservative estimates suggest that an area of tropical forests greater than the size of California was destroyed between 1992 and 2009, mostly for food and fuel. Zoo animals are destined to become splinters from the demolition of a bygone world as we rush toward a landscape of cows, pigs, and corn. Monica's made much of this clear. The concerns have been very well outlined by Jeff Bonner and Kevin Murphy. The awe-inspiring quantities of wildlife that existed when humans began to domesticate animals 10,000 years ago are all gone. At that time, people made up less than 1% of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Today, with our domestic animals, we are said to comprise over 98%. Imagine all other terrestrial vertebrates, elephants, hippos, wildebeest, bison, gorillas, antelope, mice, frogs, birds, snakes, and lizards now make up less than 2%. Yet, rivers of humans are still flooding the flatlands, overflowing the mountains, flattening the forests, and homogenizing the land. India's population is increasing by 58,000 people a day. And thousands of African elephants are being killed just for their teeth. Whatever we think about the comparatively inconsequential future of zoos, 
it is clear that they must change fundamentally if they wish to help some wildlife last long enough to have a future. In a famous Bill Cosby comedy sketch, a neighbor begged Noah for a hint as to why he is building an ark. Noah replies, how long can you tread water? <laughs> Much future wildlife conservation and science is destined to become a kind of gardening, a ranching. It will have to undertake species selection, weeding, transplanting, feeding, medicating, providing shelter, controlling predators, effecting translocation, sustaining corridors between reserves, restoring habitats, educating neighboring communities and reintroductions, as well as protection, as Jeff Bonner and, and Monica have pointed out. It is easy to agree that zoos must help parks by providing political and financial insulation. But it is difficult to change fundamental perceptions and political expectations, even with regard to zoos. Historically, most human societies have considered that animals exist mainly for the benefit of people. I wonder if the 21st century zoo can get them to agree that zoos and parks must exist mainly for the benefit of animals. Virtually all populations of sizable wild animals may eventually require such zoo animal assurance to, <coughs> excuse me, tools as accreditation and even individual species survival plans for their own well-being. Zoos must help. In the last 30 years alone, Africa's lightly managed parks have lost over half of their wildlife numbers. Yet half of the world's human increase in the next 40 years will be in Africa. Most parks are too small and their ecological conditions far too short-lived to sustain viable populations of large herbivores and carnivores. The worries that Kevin is expressing about zoos also exist about most parks. The best chance of viability for some zoo and park animal populations of larger species may depend upon complementary rescue, reintroduction, translocation, and reservoir programs, as Jeff Bonner suggested, and winning new space. And yet, what is a zoo's role in, for example, a penguin's prospects for specific species at specific places? How shall we help flamingos, wildebeest, camels, seals, warblers, turtles, and terns? Have we anything for such competitive species as elephants but elegy? Such considerations can be agonizing and immediate, especially where big predators are concerned. Consider the iconic but desperately threatened tiger. Tigers have disappeared from 93% of their historic range, more than 40% in the last decade. Constantly harassed and hunted, the populations of most big predators are being sliced into fragments too small to be genetically or demographically viable, areas too tiny to provide food. The result is the loss of breeding populations, inbreeding, and unbalanced sex ratios, followed by disappearance. As Dick Cavett put it, if your parents never had children, chances are you won't either. <laughs> Less than 4,000 tigers now remain in nature, yet their killing continues. A tiger in pieces can be worth as much as $40,000 where the daily income is $2. Besides, tigers are lousy neighbors. An average tiger needs about three and a quarter tons of live prey every year. And a tiger's raising cubs needs to kill 60 to 70 sizable prey animals each year. Thus, a single tiger requires a surplus producing population of about 500 sizable prey animals. Now, as a thought experiment, multiply the 500 prey animals necessary to produce a 10% edible annual surplus for each tiger by a viable tiger population, say 250 tigers, which may be too small. Then add the habitat necessary to sustain this population. We're talking about 125,000 sizable deer, wild pigs, and cattle. 
to maintain 250 tigers. So it's not just space, but food that determines tiger carrying capacity. Tiger scientists, primarily led by the Bronx Zoo's Wildlife Conservation Society, the World Wildlife Fund, and Panthera, are working with Asian authorities to implement a 6% solution. Because 70% of all tigers left in nature live on only 6% of their original range, conservationists seek to, to secure that 6%. Then the reasoning goes, with key animals protected, there could be a future with tigers. However, that 6% of tiger land is devoted is divided among 42 locations. The hope is to sustain wild tigers until their home range people are prepared to do so, which makes creating democracy in Afghanistan seem simple. Are the human societies where tigers live likely to want to live with them? In the United States, we cannot even assure our willingness to live with cougars or wolves. Is the tiger's fate at liberty a challenge for zoo conservation? It is, after all, a very key species. Save tigers in their habitat, and you've protected rhinos, langurs, gibbons, gaur and hornbills, trogons and turtles, leopards and deer, and much more. So beyond what the Bronx Zoo is doing, can your zoo help provide a future for tigers? The gardening of wild animals in parks and nature that I've described is not straightforward. As our globe's ecology wiggles and winces, national and zoo economies try to maintain balance on the slippery results. New directions will have to be discerned, followed, and negotiated. The minuteness of zoo potential must be understood. It is, for example, estimated that about a million animals are killed every day on American roads about the same number of animals that exists in all the collections of the World Association of Zoo and Aquariums combined. Would it make sense to share crops some threatened species with parks and what is left of nature? What are the most practical ways for zoos and parks to meet the economic and biological problems imposed by the tininess of available carrying capacity and by the complications of species-specific biology, as Monica's been worrying us? Don't forget, all the present zoo animal spaces in the world could fit within New York's borough of Brooklyn. What a marvelous improvement. <laughs> Not only is there little zoo space, but also much older animal space in zoos is not suitable for propagating the species they exhibit in a significant way. There's a need to create conservation relevant zoo space and to rethink basic zoo exhibition public services in terms of park wildlife support. Most present zoo collections are simply not sustainable under current policies. I won't go into the Lees and Wilkins study as that's already been mentioned. And I do want to add, of course, that useful propagation of endangered species is not always long term. In 1988, the last wild California condors were brought into captivity. There were only 22. There are now over 325, 168 flying free in Arizona, California, and Baja, Mexico. There were but 16 whooping cranes left when the captive program began. All gone in nature. Presently, there are about 600, 200 in captivity, and over 400 in nature. But I must tell you, because this has not been widely publicized, seven whooping cranes were shot by vandals during the past year. Peregrine falcons, Mauritius kestrels, only four were left. Mauritius parakeets, Arabian oryx, American bison, black-footed ferrets, 18 were left. Wyoming toads, Galapagos giant tortoises, and many other endangered species have been increased in captivity, reintroduced, and then managed more or less free-ranging with success, yet most zoos continue to give most of their space to species that really do not need help. There are many novel and fascinating ways to introduce people and animals. Some zoos could focus on a suite of common forms, pretty much as Monica suggested, 
but use admissions and education programs to generate conservation support for parks and reserves outside of the zoo. Whatever the myriad possibilities in the end, support of nature is key. The next task are of two kinds, for institutional administrators to develop and formalize zoo park animal support relationships, and for zoological curators and designers to develop compelling and novel zoo conservation exhibits. Some zoos are presenting an opportunity to contribute to conservation finance directly to their visitors. With the opening of the Congo Gorilla Forest in 1999, the Bronx Zoo imposed a special admission fee to support conservation in the forests of tropical Africa and gave its visitors the opportunity to choose among the ways their fees could be spent with a touch screen voting machines. By June 2009, $10,600,000 had been raised and expended on African forest conservation from this source alone, and the money continues to roll in. Zoo Boise in Boise, Idaho, has tailored its admission fee to such an approach even more strongly. It is asking to seek its zoo as a garden or park where wild animals are kept for exhibition for the primary purpose of generating funds for the conservation of animals in the wild. This expresses an essential change in the zoo's role as an extension of the effort to sustain nature. The AZA Field Committee has initiated a vigorous new wildlife park program under Boise Steve Burns, which was appointed, I might say, by Jeff Bonner. It seeks to have each AZA institution allot a percent of its budget to park conservation. Its first tallied total for the year 2010 was $130 million. Where the links between saving biodiversity and human well-being are tenuous, the fate of wildlife may depend entirely on human compassion and aesthetics. In focusing on these crucial relationships, zoos bring forth the reality, depth, and beauty of their living collections, which are so usually located in human population centers. The sensitive artistry and lessons now being conveyed at the best zoo exhibits can be a powerful tool, enabling the zoo's animals to become avatars of a real but vanishing world. Inherent in the nature of zookeeping is a dream of conservation, conservation heroics, of preserving wild species forever. Nowadays, our best chance to address this vision is by supporting parks and wildlife environments and providing emergency support to vanishing species in the zoo. The next few decades may be our last chance to save much of the Earth's most wonderful wildlife. Only a little bit of this can be done directly in zoos, but much can be done with the help of zoos, and it is time for them to convey that message as they evolve to become field-based nature cons conservation organizations. The transition of zoos toward a restorative and creative presence in the Earth system would breach a conceptual boundary of what zoos can be and how they can serve. Zoos are, after all, the only institutions our society has ever created for the exhibition and care of wildlife. It is a paradox that they have not yet made preservation of wildlife their highest priority. Their future is to do so. Thank you. <laughs>